Good morning, Journey Church. Welcome to our online service. We're so glad you're tuning in this morning. Make sure and hit that like button, that share button, so your friends can follow along and watch with you. Uh, we're continuing our, our series this week as we talk about what it looks like to be the way and to follow Jesus. And so we're about to get started, and thanks for tuning in. Journey has always strived to be the church that Bullock County needs. Our focus has been on creating a community of people who are chasing after the kingdom. During difficult times such as these, we want to be showing compassion, love, and to offer a helping hand to those who are struggling. While we want to make sure we're meeting the spiritual needs of our neighbors, we also want to be able to offer food, clothing, and other support. This is a time where you can help partner with us to be able to continue meeting those needs. Your gift, no matter how small, will help us to continue our efforts of helping our friends and neighbors. Your donations allow us to assist in those in our church as well as outside 
and groups like 11 Choice, Scarlet Hope, and Bullock County Housing First. Download the app to partner with us and give once or set up recurring giving so that we may continue to make an impact in our community. So this week I just want to have a conversation. We've obviously been in this series and been talking about all kinds of ideas of what it looks like to follow Jesus. And what's happened for me over the last couple of months is I've had a lot of time to reflect, um, to study, and to question a lot of things. And one of the questions that keeps coming to mind, for me at least, is, is, is our, what we're doing you know, as a church when we gather together. And I posed the question last week in my sermon, and I meant it, that you know, have we tricked ourselves into thinking that, that, that meeting on Sundays was the most important thing and was actually keeping us from being the church? And so what I want to do today is just kind of extend that conversation a little bit and talk a little bit more about that. Because I think one of the things that can happen is we can convince ourselves um, this idea that, that that's the most important thing. And one of the things that happens is when Jesus comes onto the scene is he does something different because he, he comes into a world very similar to ours with, with all kinds of problems and, and issues and, and all kinds of cultural things that have to be worked through. And, and what he does is he, he kind of breaks it down and he says, okay, let's talk about some, some real basic stuff. Now, this basic stuff isn't, isn't easy. Um, in fact, you'll see that the, the thing we're going to talk about today is one of the things we've talked about a lot around here. But, but I've often found that the, the things that, that I wish Jesus hadn't said because they're difficult are often the things that I need to hear the most. And part of the reason we need to have this conversation about what we're going to talk about today and even the next couple of weeks is this. this. This idea of actually really loving each other. And if you question why we need to talk about that, all you need to do is turn on the news or get on Facebook or Twitter and kind of see kind of what's going on in our world today. And so that's the why. The other reason we need to have this conversation is not just for you, but it's for me. I need to remind myself all the time that this is what it's supposed to be about. I need to remind myself that this is, when it comes to following Jesus, this is the goal. This is the thing that we're chasing after. So there's this teaching by Jesus that as soon as I start to read it, you're going to recognize it. It's this famous teaching of his, but, but it is one of the hardest things for us to kind of adapt and kind of put into our lives. And in Matthew chapter 22, what's essentially going on is there's these religious leaders, and they're always trying to trip up Jesus, because when he comes on the scene, the things that he says and he does, it, it does sound foreign to them. It's not something they're familiar with, and in some way it challenges them and kind of what they believe. Maybe the same way it should challenge us today. And so there's these two groups of leaders. There's the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And, and the Sadducees, they try to trip Jesus up, and, and you should read it for yourself. I don't have time, but... They ask him one of the most ridiculous questions you could ask Jesus, and, and he kind of shuts them down. And so the Pharisees, it, it's their turn. And so they decide that they're going to ask him a question as well. And so in Matthew chapter 22, it says this, Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. And one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, and you've heard this before, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And, and we like this idea. Because I'll be honest with you, you, you can fake loving God. I mean, you can show up week after week and, and you can attend studies and you can sing your songs and, and you can do all of that. And so if it just is, I have to love God, well, well then there's no real way to kind of test that. We, we can all say that we love God. But Jesus doesn't stop there, and so he continues, and he said, The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. And we have to understand like, how big of a deal this was, how important this teaching really was. And here's where the pushback comes is we hear that and we go, well, that sounds great, Jesus, but, but clearly you don't know who my neighbors were. You, you've never had the neighbors that I've had. Because we could all tell stories about some of our neighbors. But it gets even worse than just what we think of as neighbors. What Jesus is actually talking about is not just our literal, literal physical neighbor. He's actually talking about the people in our community, the people in our workplaces, the people around us. And so it gets much worse than just the people that live to your right and to your left and maybe behind you or across the street from you. He's talking about all of the people that we come in contact with. And so it's this idea that, that listen, if you're going to kind of follow me, you have to understand that you do need to love God. I mean, that's a part of it. But you also have to love 
each other. And the big pushback from this, this idea of love each other and love your neighbor as yourself is, is it's hard to love some people. And it's definitely hard to love people as much as we love ourselves. We live in a world where we all have agendas and we all, if we talked about a couple weeks ago, want to push ourselves forward and get ahead in life. And so the idea of loving and treating people in a way that it's not just about us, it's also about them and trying to help them in life, especially the difficult people, that can be tough. And the reason it can be tough is this, is because people are difficult. I mean, I mean, the big pushback, honestly, is this. I mean, when it comes to people and loving people, part of the problem is we all have people that have different political views than we do. And we have people in our lives who, who, who see the, kind of the cultural climate differently. We have people in our lives that see the racial tension in our country differently than we do. We have people in our lives right now that see the season that we're in with this disease and this virus and how we can deal with it differently. We have people in our life that want to wear masks and people that don't want to wear masks. So we have all these different viewpoints and opinions and it's when people don't match up with the viewpoint and opinion that we have, what do we do with that? The reality is we all have those people in our life. People that get under our skin, people that drive us crazy, people that we, we just don't see the world the same way. One of the interesting things I found over the last couple of weeks as I've kind of been reading the Gospels is, is this idea that Jesus doesn't really have those people. He never has a group of people that he actually disqualifies. I mean, as we saw in this text, he has some run-ins with some religious leaders, but we also see other times where these same religious leaders, that if they're willing to actually talk and listen, Jesus is willing to do the same. And so Jesus kind of has this approach where he thinks that everybody has value and worth, and, and so Jesus loves people. He loves difficult people. And then he challenges us with this idea for us to love one another. It's this idea that he gives, like right before he, he's about to go to the cross, he, he gathers his group of followers together, and it's this moment where he, he gets them together and he says, listen, there's this command that I'm going to give you, and this is, this is the way that people are going to know if you're my follower, is that you love one another. And then he adds the caveat that it's difficult for all of us, the way that I've loved you. Now, we have to understand that when he teaches this, and this is a hard teaching, this is hard for all of us, but these first followers of Jesus, they take it and they run with it. I mean, this idea of loving people, even people that see the world differently than us and even people that are difficult to love, this is what changed the world. This is this idea that took off, and we have to understand the power in this. I mean, these first Christians, we have to understand, they came from different parts of the world. And they came from different towns and villages that had different traditions and different ideas. And, and so you have these first Jewish converts that, that see the world differently than some of the Gentiles that start to come into the church. And it was in the Gentiles, as we said, they come from different areas and different regions. And, and so they have different traditions themselves. And, and, and so they have all these different ideas. But what they decide to do is amazing. They decide they're going to filter all of their decision making through this one kind of idea of what does it look like to love my neighbor as myself? What does it look like to make sure that the needs of my neighbor are met? Those who are in align with, alignment with what we believe and what we understand about Jesus. But as we'll see in history, even those that don't align themselves with Christ, the early Christians, they said, we're going to meet the needs of the people around us. We're going to actually love these People. And that idea changed the world. Now, for some of you, what, what you may say is, okay, like I get that and maybe I can love people that get on my nerves a little bit or have a little bit different worldview than I do, but what do we do about the people that we consider our enemies? The, the people that we just really don't care for at all, and to be honest, we don't think that, that God would care for them. There's this famous story where Jesus takes this idea and he illustrates it. And he tells this story, and we're all familiar with it, but essentially he makes what everybody in that audience would view as the bad guy actually the person that loves his neighbor the most. And so Jesus even has this like controversial teaching. It's one of the hardest things. He says to love your enemies and pray for them and even give things to them. 
I mean, it's this really hard idea, but, but we have to understand that this is the way Jesus saw things. And this idea is actually really what did change the world. I mean, the thing I think we have to understand the most is this. It's when Christians understand the love of God and then reflect that in the world around us. It's in this understanding that this is going to be hard. The other thing we have to understand is this, and I think this is something that we struggle with in the American church, if I'm being honest, is that we think that we have to have power and influence in order to actually live out the gospel and love the people around us. But one of the things we have to understand through history is, especially these early Christians, and even throughout history beyond that, it's typically in environments where they were even oppressed that the love was able to, to see and to change the world around them. They had this idea that, that they saw the world for what it was and the power grabs that people have, and they knew that something better had to be available. And so they continued to love even when they were oppressed, even when they were put down. They continued to love the world around them because they wanted to see the world around them change, and they wanted to see themselves change. I mean, I'll be honest with you. If we're going to love like this, it's going to be a challenge. But we have to also understand this. Just because the political candidate that we want doesn't win, just because people on Facebook or Twitter post things that we don't like, that isn't an excuse not to love. That isn't an excuse not to be the kind of people that reflect the love that God has for us. I mean, to be honest with you, the only way we're going to do this is if we understand that. That the reason we love people is not because we all agree on everything or because we all see everything the same way. The way we're going to love people is honestly to remember this idea. It comes from Romans chapter 5. It's this idea that, that, that Paul tells us that while we were still sinners, well, the language he even uses later is while we were still enemies of God, he sent Christ to die for us. That even we were in opposition to him in our life, that he loved us so much that he was willing to see past that stuff. And that's the type of love that we're supposed to express to the world around us. So like 20 or 30 years after Jesus, the church is starting to take off. And one of the places it's starting to take off is in Rome. Now, so Paul, he's going to write this letter to, to these Roman Christians. And you got to understand that these, these Christians that are living in Rome at this time, I mean, they are in the heart of the oppression. I mean, not too long from now is going to be Nero's circus in which he feeds Christians the lions and he lights Christians up as torches at his garden parties. I mean, these people are being run out of their homes and their villages and they're being persecuted. And so Paul writes this letter. And what's amazing about this letter that he writes and some of the things that is this idea of being able to love people in spite of all of the things that you're going through in spite of the hardships around you and maybe even in some of the ways that the ways that world is treating you, that we can still love the people around us. And one of the most fascinating things that comes out of this, and if you've tuned out, you've got to tune back into this, is, is this. In, in Romans chapter 13, Paul is going to give this teaching. It starts by saying this, Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. And so Paul gives this idea that even with everything going on and all of the opposition you're facing, that there's this idea that, that we should love others because we're almost like indebted to them. And we're not indebted to them because they've been good or that they've even earned or deserved necessarily maybe some of the love that we would give them. No, the idea is this, and John talks about this too, is the reason that we love people, the reason that we're indebted is because of the love that God has shown us. And then this is the crazy part, because I think for a lot of us, what we want is we want to know what God wants from us. And we want to be obedient to kind of the will in his life. And so we have all these different ideas of what this looks like. And we talked earlier kind of this idea about like following the law and being obedient to that. But listen to what Paul says about love here. He says this in verse 9. The commandment, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And whatever other command there are, are summed up into this one idea. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the rules you thought you had to follow, all of the things you thought you had to do in order 
for God to love you. It's almost like this idea that like Paul's saying like, listen, if you were to go to God and say, hey, thanks for loving me so much, what do you want from me? His response is love the people around you. This idea, like we said, it changed the world. It, it changed Rome. This idea of loving each other and meeting each other's needs. Paul's going to go on later. He's going to talk about this idea of what it would look like if we forgave each other and we served each other and we carried one another's burdens. And it's like this whole list of these one another ideas that, that listen, part of loving people is understanding that we don't just say we love, it's in the actions that we have. And so what if we did these things? And so within his writings, there's all these ideas of how we can love the people around us. And so the question I have for us is, what would it look like if we actually did that? What would it look like if we actually loved our neighbor? And maybe that just means our actual physical neighbors, but also the people around us. And I know it's tough. I mean, we've been saying that this whole time, that this is going to be difficult. This is going to be hard. But imagine a world in which we'd gotten this right. Imagine a world in which we had decided that love is going to be the thing that leads us, and we're going to filter our decision-making through what it means to actually love those around us, those in our family, those in our neighborhood, those in our schools, in our workplaces, that we really had this idea and we understood that in order to follow Christ, that part of that is loving like He loved. Imagine the difference it would make. And, and so we're going to talk a little bit more about that next week, about some of the real actual applications of that. And I think some of you actually know what the application is. Like, you already know, like, this is what it looks like to love people. It's just, it's, it's hard. And so we're going to work through that together. And we're going to work through some of these ideas over the next couple of weeks of what that really means and what that can look like so that we can be people that reach our families, reach our communities with the love of Christ and that we continue to follow Him and to walk in His way. So let's pray together. Father God, I pray that you, um, you, you give us a spirit that understands the importance of this and what this looks like to love each other. And God, I know that it's tough um, because we're difficult. Um, we, are, we are difficult creatures. We're difficult people. Um, and God, even the people that's easy to love, sometimes it's hard. And so the idea of loving people, even the people that see the world differently than us, is incredibly challenging. But it's that challenge that you want, and I still believe you can change the world through. So God, give us a strength um, within us to, to take that on, um, to give us wisdom, God, to, to know what to say in certain situations we find ourselves in. And so God, I just pray that, that we can be people that love, that, that love our neighbors, that love the people in our lives, God. And, and maybe, God, most importantly, it starts even at home, just loving our family well and putting others first, God. So God, just give us the strength in that, God. And I pray for the people that are still struggling with all of this. And God, there's so much going on in our world and even in our city um, this week, God, that, that you give us peace, um, God. And again, you give us wisdom on, on how to handle some of those situations. And um, God, as some of those difficult conversations may have to take place within our homes and within friends and family, God, that you give us wisdom, um, God. And all of it, you, you allow us to speak grace and mercy and hope into people. And we do it all in love, God. And so we love you and we thank you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation. I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. And through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end. Oh, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom 
such boundless grace, the God of ages, stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The
days come today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling Treasure you found. 